Today on Paul's Old Crap, we're going to take a tour of the Riverstone Network's RS-8000, which is a router switch combo device, or more commonly known as a Layer 3 switch, made by a company that went bankrupt ages ago. Before we jump into the hardware tour, let's discuss Riverstone Networks and what became of them. Trying to research this company led me down a rabbit hole of acquisitions and bankruptcies, so I'm hoping the following information is accurate, but some details have been lost to time. Our story begins in the year 1996, which is unfortunately better known for events such as the explosion of TWA Flight 800 and the death of John Benet Ramsey. 1996 did also bring a small startup named Yago Systems, which was one of a number of gigabit Ethernet startups looking to hit the market with this hot new technology. While the company was seemingly still in R&D stages in 1997, some old news articles indicated there was acquisition interest from big players such as Cisco and Cabletron, with the latter having already invested in the company. In early 1998, Cabletron announced the acquisition agreement for Yago. Sometime in the year 2000, Cabletron reorganized as a holding company and what was previously known as Yago Systems became a spin-off named Riverstone Networks. They seemed to spend a few years cranking out Metro Ethernet solutions up until 2006 when they were purchased by Lucent under what appears to be a Chapter 11 bankruptcy agreement. Almost immediately after this, Alcatel and Lucent began merger talks and both entities merged into Alcatel-Lucent in late 2006. By this point, Riverstone was pretty much gone and there doesn't appear to have been any further development with the Riverstone software. Ten years later, in 2016, Nokia acquired Alcatel-Lucent and now in 2020, Riverstone Networks is nothing more than a painful memory for people like me who had to keep this crap running with no vendor to support it. The Riverstone model we're going to look at today is the RS-8000, which seems to be the mid-range model between the smaller RS-3000 and the massive beast known as the RS-38000. The RS-3000 was a semi-modular design which had fixed 10100 Ethernet ports and expansion bays for gigabit modules. The RS-38000 was a full modular design with massive line cards and the ability to directly connect hundreds of Ethernet devices. Doing a quick look on eBay doesn't show much still available for the RS-8000, but it looks like numerous types of modules were originally available, such as T1, T3, and ATM. If my previous rambling about the history of Riverstone wasn't interesting enough, this particular Riverstone does have a bit of a story. In 2005, I joined a data center operation which ran their entire core network on Riverstone devices, including this one, but it seemed like the kind of place that was buying their servers either on eBay or bankruptcy auctions. I became more curious when I noticed this asset tag for a company called Metricom, which operated an internet service called Ricochet in some American markets until their bankruptcy in 2001. The fate of their assets is another long story of liquidations and acquisitions, and somewhere along the way at least one of their Riverstones apparently made it up here into Canada. I pulled this unit from our Riverstone garbage pile, which includes an RS-38000 and numerous RS-3000 models. So the Riverstone RS-8000 is a fully modular system in that all of the modules here are fully removable. So in this unit here, we do have redundant power supplies, although you don't necessarily need to have both of them plugged in to operate the system. Uh, potentially that might be a case if you have all of the bays full, but in this configuration that I have here, I only end up using one of the power supplies at any given time. Now in this unit as well, we do only have one of the control modules. There's a little diagram down here in the corner where it says uh, you've got your two power supplies. Your control module goes in this spot only. The spot next to it though can be used for a control module or your slot one. So in this case we only have the one control module and in the spot next to it is our uh, 10100 Ethernet. 
So if you were going to be using the multiple control modules for that uh, failover, you would need to have it in that spot there. Otherwise, you could use it just as a normal uh, expansion module. So in this particular case, one control module, uh, this is our 10 slash 100 ethernet. This is copper ethernet. And then over here and these, uh, this module here, this is our gigabit ethernet and it's thousand base SX. Uh, it's a fiber based connection. I don't believe there was any copper based uh, gigabit ethernet modules for this system. So if you were looking to have your gigabit ethernet, it was basically fiber optic only and then your copper modules there. And then that would give you room left over for if you wanted to do T1, T3, ATM modules or whatever else. So if we take a closer look at the modules, uh, for example, this is one of the power supplies. Um, not really much to it. Uh, basically it just has these connections here which plug into the back plane of the system. And I am not entirely sure if these are uh, hot swappable. I want to assume they are. But uh, that's something I'm sure the manual would uh, explain in detail. Uh, so if we take a look at the control module. So this one that we've got here, it does have two RAM slots, as you can see here. But we only have one memory stick installed. And this is a 128 megabyte uh, RAM stick. Um, I was figuring we probably could upgrade this if we really needed to. But uh, if we're just doing a basic demo, I don't think it's really required. Uh, the only other thing we've got that's notable on here, um, that our PC card, uh, like flash media stuff. I don't see anything obviously wrong with this connection, but I've never been able to get uh, the flash cards to actually work in here. So when we do the booting of this, it will actually be doing it over the network because I, I can't get media that actually works in here. Um, we do have a old Dallas clock chip, and it's strange because I think this thing still works. Uh, this thing was still holding the uh, original time and date from when it was actually run in production like 10 years ago, so that is, uh, that is strange. And I'm not entirely sure which is actually the processor. Uh, this is a, I think it's the MIPS R5000 processor that this is actually using. Um, it, it does mention R5000 when you're actually booting it up. And that might be what's under here. Um, Cause there is a, I don't think that would be it, no. Yeah, I can only assume the actual processor is, uh, is under there. So. And oh, so the control module, of course, is where we have our console port, and we do have our um, our management port here. Which the way the um, operating system handling this, it's kind of strange because uh, the interface that it comes up as uh, is EN zero, but then for some reason you can't really apply certain configurations to it. So. I don't know, it's it's kind of strange the way the operating system works for that, and I don't even fully know, so... Yeah, we'll get into that, though, further in the demo. Um, but let's take a look at... This is our copper Ethernet module. So, I think we've just basically got the, uh, the controllers for all the ports, or whatever. Who knows? Um, yeah, nothing too interesting about this, and it does give you eight ports in total. And on here, it does actually have a, uh, what is that? I can't tell if that's a, uh, I think it's actually a little small button in there for this hot swap. And I'm not too sure how you would use that. Maybe you have to click this button because it's got this little switch that's, uh, that's inside here. So, I don't know, maybe you have to push that if you intend on removing this from the system when it's running. I suppose I could try. I mean, I'm not overly concerned about this thing blowing up, but I'd hate to break it. And this is our uh, gigabit fiber optic module. Um, yeah, there's really not much to this. This is basically the same thing you'd find in a Cisco router of the era. The uh, you can't change these uh, 
this hardware out on some of the Cisco ones that I've got from this time, like my VXR router. Uh, basically, you have to have your own little adapter piece that uh, slides into a slot. Um, this one is stuck with this type, which I believe is the LC type fiber optics. I'm hoping that is correct. It's been a while since I've used something that ancient, but yeah. Yeah, there's really not much to these boards, so. And then of course the one we've got over here is the exact same. No point really taking it out. So yeah, we do have four empty slots that it would be nice if I had other modules to demo for this thing. Uh, but I took a look on eBay and uh, because I'm in Canada, it doesn't really show a whole lot of available modules that I could buy. And also I don't really want to spend a whole lot of money on this old router because it's beyond this video. I'm probably never going to use this again and I might actually return it to the garbage pile that I uh, found it in. So, yeah. Alright, so I've powered up the Riverstone RS8000 and I am consoled into it because we haven't uh, actually booted into the operating system yet uh, or done any configuration. Uh, right now we're in the, uh, the initial bootloader type thing, which is uh, similar to a Cisco router uh, that has, I think, a thing called ROMMON. Um, yeah, this one is just basically the Riverstone initial booter thingamajigger. And as you can see from the output on the console, uh, it does tell us we have the R5000 processor. Uh, it's just shy of 200 megahertz, and it is detecting 128 megabytes of RAM. Now, it does also say there that the external flash card is absent, which uh, I think I mentioned earlier. Uh, this machine, for some reason, uh, I can't get any of my flash cards to work in it. And uh, when I pulled it off the garbage pile, it didn't have one in there either, and it was already configured to network boot, so I suspect the thing's been broken for some time. So we do have to do a TFTP boot of the system, and I do have a copy of the Riverstone operating system ready to go for this on a TFTP server. So, uh, I've already configured this, but if you see, um, when I type set in the console there, it basically outputs all of the configured options for the booting system. Uh, there's probably not a whole lot you would ever need to change. Like, if you actually wanted to, you could change the prompt, apparently. Um, and then you can add like a name server in there, uh, whatever that is. Uh, I'm just gonna actually let's do, there we go. Okay, so at the end there, it does tell us all of the network boot options. So, uh, in here, I think there's actually some typos in here. Um, there's some old data. So like there's a, uh, when you're defining the file name of the operating system, it's called boot source. Um, someone previously mistyped it as bout source, and then there was the old ROS 9.1 image. Uh, but anyway, uh, what we've got down here, um, we're telling it to look for a file called ROS 9406. Um, that's basically, I think the operating system is called Rapid OS, um, which I will see in a moment here. Um, so that's that's the ROS part of the file name, and then 9406 is the version, it's 9.4 of the operating system. And the rest of this is basically the network, config uh, the network configuration of the built-in Ethernet um, for like the actual management module. So that is separate from the actual Ethernet modules that we had in the, uh, in the unit there. So it's the one Ethernet port that's on the management uh, module there. Uh, we're telling it what its IP address is. Uh, this is basically my internal lab network here. So we define its IP address, we define the gateway of my network, uh, we define uh, this one down here I believe is the IP of my TFTP server, and then we do have some miscellaneous crap that was in here where I think the variables were mistyped uh, or there's one here that says boo adder instead of boot adder. So, um, yeah, some of this uh, old junk has been in here probably for like 15 years. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, but I already do have all of this information already set up. And I do know it does TFTP boot because I tested all this before. 
So what we're going to do now is we're just going to type in boot and it's going to go ahead and start the load off the network. So right here we have the source TFTP server with the IP address and the file name uh, finds it um, version 9.4.0.6 and it says the build date of this is 2005. And as far as I know, this was the last uh, release of this operating system ever before the company just kind of went through more acquisitions and buyouts and then basically just ceased to exist. The people were probably reassigned to who knows what, but um, yeah, so the ROS image is one single file. And then I think what happens is it extracts it into all of these different sections. So we have things that are uh, things that catch my eye, like ATM, WAN, uh, down here we have MPLS. Um, oh, but here we go. It says Rapid OS right across your screen. Um, so I think, yeah, that's basically the actual name of the operating system. And it says here, it's the RS8000, Riverstone Networks, copyright 2000 to 2005. Uh, tells us our processor again. Um, and now it's basically doing the same thing that you would expect from, let's say, a Cisco router, where it's going through and discovering all of its hardware. And I already did uh, delete my existing configuration file before reloading the router, so it's basically doing a raw configuration, and uh, we'll get to that as soon as it loads. But, uh, yeah, you can see it discovered the Ethernet module, the pair of gigabit modules, and now it's basically, okay, so it's basically at its final stage. Uh, let's see, press return to activate console, and it, we don't have a password or anything set up right now, so it's running on basically the defaults. And stop interrupting me there. Okay, I think it's finally loaded all of its crap. Uh, so, similar to a Cisco, you have to go into enable mode, and um, we're in a, enable mode now, and... Similar to a Cisco, it also has a separate configuration mode, which we've now entered as well, because this is where we actually perform a configuration. Uh, I think what we're going to do is set some passwords. So we do uh, system set uh, password login, and we're going to have the password as Riverstone. So we do that, and it accepts it. Um, system set password enable Riverstone so we're doing the uh, the initial login password to even get in and we're setting an enable password and then what we're going to do is define the IP address of the management Ethernet because I don't want to have to use console on this I want to actually be able to connect over the network uh, this one interface uh, add IP and then EN0 is the actual name of that one Ethernet port. Um, the naming convention for all other Ethernet is much different. Um, so that's just basically the way the Riverstone handled it for that one management network. Um, okay, so anyway, um, address dash netmask. Uh, let's see, I allocated 10.16.1.2. 252 and then you add the subnet mask um, We're going to go ahead and I think I think we have to manually add the um, gateway uh, IP add route Default gateway 10.16.1.1 um, Okay, now one thing to note and I'll get into this in a bit um, when we uh, start doing some more advanced configuration, but None of the stuff I've entered has actually taken effect. It's sitting in something called the scratch pad. And, uh, let's see. So the command that's show, um, if we do show scratch pad, um, these are basically the commands that we've entered, and right now they're non-committed. So the system has not actually added them to the active configuration. So to do that, we do save active and so apparently most of it took except for the gateway thing um, 
I think I must have somehow done that wrong. Um, yeah, it still worked though. I think I ran into this exact same problem first time around. Um, but what I'm going to do though is I'm going to just do a save startup um, so that we've actually built our startup configuration. Uh, then what I'm going to do is just, oh no, it's not end, it's control Z or exit, I guess. Um, if we do show, um, show running config, and now we do have the configuration options that we already set, and everything is uh, ready to go for uh, doing a reboot. And uh, I'll probably talk a little bit more about the configuration um, afterward. Um, but yeah, just uh, there's one main difference between um, how these, uh, the Riverstones configure uh, stuff like this and uh, Cisco. Uh, the Riverstone uses numbers for all of the entered um, configuration lines, which uh, is interesting because you can actually do things with the line numbers. Um, but yeah, we have line two and there's an E next to it. And I think that indicates that there was an error applying this configuration line. So um, even though I have this in the active configuration, I don't think it's actually doing anything because there is a, an error in possibly the syntax or however it works. I think I may have needed to add an additional uh, bit of information to that. So yeah. Anyway, uh, one thing I did notice when I was doing the setup originally is that once you've got the initial network set up, uh, Telnet access to it is enabled by default. So all basically just adding the IP address to this system is all it really takes. Well, along with uh, adding the passwords, um, that's basically all it takes to uh, to access this device over the uh, over the network with Telnet. And I'm not going to bother with SSH because, well, who cares? It's an internal network. Um, Telnet is fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pause the video here and I'm going to um, establish a Telnet session to this and uh, we'll continue with some more configuration. All right, so I've got my Telnet uh, session open to the IP address that we previously configured and uh, comes up with uh, kind of this little... Um, message box here and then it says press return to activate console so I'm gonna press return and now it's going to prompt me for the password and this is the login password that we previously set um, which is Riverstone and it doesn't uh, block it from view it does it in like clear text wide open there so that's kind of funny um, anyway, so we've basically telneted um, back into the uh, router, um, and I think what we're going to do is, um, whoops, the, the way this is showing up in telnet is hilarious, it's kind of like lagging on my screen, but, um, wow, this is terrible. Um, anyway, we're going to just do a... Uh, what in the hell? It's like doubling on my screen. This is weird. Hmm. It's showing up as all weird, but it's the actual command does work after. That's bizarre. Huh. Um, well, my management network is up, and unfortunately, for some reason, this system sucks over Telnet. It was not doing this before. I have no idea what its problem is. Uh, I'm actually going to hop back over to uh, doing it with the serial console, because this is kind of ridiculous. So, uh, give me a sec. All right, so we're back in the uh, serial console and I've got back in with my login password. And now if we issue commands, uh, it all shows up properly in my console, not garbled with the command, so I have no idea. 
Uh, anyway, uh, we do a ping test here. The router is able to ping my uh, default gateway. And as I demonstrated, I was able to access it over the network. So all of that is okay. Uh, but what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to just do a, a brief demonstration of uh, a couple commands and stuff like that. Um, let's see. I think what we're going to do first is we have to get into enable mode and enter our password. And we're going to go into configure mode. And I'm just going to do a question mark here. And uh, we're going to take a look at some of these various commands. Um, so a lot of the way this is done is uh, is a lot different from Cisco syntax. So if you're if you're familiar with Cisco's, you won't get anywhere with this. It is so much different. Um, but yeah, like if you're doing BGP commands, uh, obviously it starts off with BGP here. Um, some of this might be the same. Like ACLs might be similar, but um, yeah, some of this old school technology might be familiar to some people. Like we got frame relay in there. Uh, let's see. Uh, we do have our MPLS uh, command here for dealing with MPLS. Uh, we have OSPF. Uh, we'll deal with that in a bit. Um, and the way this is uh, the way this is done. Um, let me try something here. So, when, if you, as we saw in that listing of commands, um, MPLS was one of them, and instead of having to type in a full command, all I can do is enter MPLS, and it takes me into this, like, sub-configuration mode, specifically of the MPLS settings, and then um, you can go in and, like, uh, add, and then... Uh, interface and blah 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 and basically do all of your uh, MPLS settings so if you had a lot of uh, commands to enter for uh, your MPLS configuration you could just go into MPLS and then do them all like that instead of having to type in MPLS in front of all of them so um, I don't know that's that's kind of neat uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna control Z back to the main configuration section here and what we're gonna do is we're going to create a VLAN. Now, on a Cisco router, you type in VLAN and the number and you're done. On the Riverstone, it's slightly more comp uh, complicated. Um, let's see here. We type in VLAN, then we type in create, then we have to type in a name, test VLAN, uh, then we have to decide what kind of VLAN it is. So you can make a VLAN for Apple Talk traffic. You can make a VLAN for uh, IPX traffic. Um, you can make a VLAN for whatever else is in there. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the one that says port based because that says create this VLAN for all traffic, all protocols. So, whoops. Come on. Okay, so port-based. Then it says we have to type in ID. Then we actually have to give it an ID number of 999. So all of that just to make one VLAN. And we hit enter. And as we noticed before, uh, the system uses what's called a scratch pad. So even though we've just run this VLAN uh, create command, the VLAN has not actually been created. What we have to do is... Um, we have to do our show scratch pad. Well, I mean, this is not required, um, but this is something when we were running um, at my job and we were running Riverstones in production, well, we always had to look at the scratch pad to make sure that all of our commands were correct and we weren't going to do something hilariously stupid on our production routers. Um, so in our scratch pad, uh, it also kind of numbers our scratch pad changes. So it says we've got the number one here, and this, uh, the one command in our scratch pad is VLAN create test VLAN, and it looks good. So we're going to go ahead and save the active configuration. And now we're prompted with a message that the VLAN has been created. And if you want to add this VLAN to different interfaces, um, you do this VLAN add ports command. So if we were going to do, 
Uh, hell, let's try this. VLAN, add ports, um, and then all of the different types of interfaces. Um, now, we don't have a T1, we don't have a T3, we don't have ATM, we don't have PPP, we don't have frame relay. Uh, what we do have is some gigabit Ethernet stuff. And there's, there's no cables plugged into our gigabit Ethernet stuff, so uh, it's safe to just mess around with those interfaces if we feel like. Um, so if we do... Uh, let's see if we can just do a question mark here. GI dot? No, okay. Let's see if this one's active. VLAN add port GI.1.1. I don't know if this is even a proper interface. This might not even work. Let's try 3.1, because I think that might be the number of the module. And, okay, VLAN add ports, and then you have to put the word 2. Uh, and then you have to actually remember the name that you gave your VLAN. Uh, and that was test VLAN, and press return to execute, uh, show the scratch pad, um, VLAN add ports, okay, save active, uh, okay, okay, that doesn't exist there, we have to go back here, show the running configuration, um, well, it looks like the command took, so maybe that interface does exist, and I remembered it properly. Um, oh man, I totally don't remember how this stupid machine work. Uh, whoops. Uh, interface, show, uh, IP. <laughs> oh no, port. Show. Um... Port status. Uh, all ports. Oh yeah, okay, there we go. So, um, that's basically how you get a listing of all the interfaces that are actually on your router. And uh, looks like my memory did work properly. Um, GI.3.1 was actually a valid Ethernet interface on here. And as you can see, all of this is down because there's nothing plugged into it. So link state is down on everything. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically how you uh, you add that VLAN to different interfaces. And it's the way this works is so weird. And then if you want to do like access or trunk ports, it's like so many weird commands to make this thing work properly. But uh, um, here's something we're going to do, though. Uh, if we go back into the um, show running configuration, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to undo the uh, VLAN create. And instead of deleting the configuration line from the system outright, we're going to use uh, a neat little trick that Riverstone has where we can actually comment out lines of our file. So we're going to go into our... Um, Configuration mode, uh, if we do comment out, and then it basically asks us for the line number, uh, we're going to say comment out line one, because that's the VLAN create command. So if we do that, and we show the scratch pad, um, we are about to comment out, and then the VLAN create. We run our save active, and, oh... <laughs> so the system is smart because it knows we're dumb and we left a port trunked in that VLAN um, we, so there's nothing in my scratch pad I wonder if we go back into whoops okay so it's still in there because line number two conflicts with having line number one deleted. Uh, we're going to do comment out one comma two. Show the scratch pad. And now 
we're going to remove, or we're not going to remove, we're going to comment out both of those lines at the same time. And we're going to do save active. Boom! We remove ports GI31 from VLAN and we successfully remove the VLAN from the running configuration. Uh, just to confirm, we're going to do a show running configuration. And now you can see the difference in the configuration file. Uh, we have the letter C next to the line number. This indicates that it's basically commented out. And then we have a couple slashes there. Um, kind of like the same thing you would see in, uh, I don't know, in programming um, before a commented out line of code or a comment in the, uh, in the code there. So yeah, the way this file works is uh, it's kind of interesting. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm used to Cisco where you enter a command and immediately it immediately just accepts it. Um, that can be good, that can be bad. If you type in the wrong thing and you hit enter and your router goes down, well, uh, you're pretty much stuck unless um, you decided to do like the old trick of setting a timed reboot in the system and then running all your changes and then making sure you disable the timed reboot, assuming everything works. And then if it didn't work, you would just wait for the thing to reload. Um, yeah, that's kind of funny, but... Uh, so that's basically, um, the basics of Riverstone. Uh, we're not going to get into anything overly complex. Uh, I think what we're going to do though is, um, we're going to do a small lab with the OSPF, uh, routing protocol. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned and, uh, we'll get started in that. All right, so what we're going to do now is we've got a Cisco 2600 series router. Uh, this particular router is the 2621XM, and we're going to use this for our OSPF lab. So I've pre-configured the Cisco router to uh, already have OSPF set up on its Ethernet interface. So what we're going to do now is take the Ethernet wire from this router, plug it into the first Ethernet slot of our module here, and we have link up, and now what we're going to do is perform the configuration of the Riverstone so that it talks to the Cisco router. Okay, so what we've done is we've got the Cisco router uh, all powered up and booted up and plugged into our one of our Ethernet ports on the Riverstone. And as you can see in our console session here, um, it does say that uh, the Ethernet interface has gone uh, up and down a couple times during the Cisco's boot process when it goes and does all of its magic. Uh, and I think our session expired, so we just have to uh, get back in here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're in enable mode. And what we want to do is uh, set up an OSPF interface on this one here, Ethernet 1.1. So uh, let's enter configuration mode. And uh, this is how we assign an IP address specifically to that interface. We go uh, interface create um, IP and now we actually have to give it a name. So we're going to go ahead and call it OSPF link and um, address dash netmask and then the actual address. Um, I've pre-configured this um, to be compatible with the, uh, the Cisco router on the other side of this. Um, so I think the Cisco router I gave 10.20.30.1 as the IP address. Um, and then we do port and then it asks us what port and that was Ethernet, whoops, Ethernet 1.1. Uh, and then we add the word up at the very end. We hit enter. Um, we do our show scratch pad and it looks good. Do save active. And so here we go. It says, um, port successfully added to... 
And then the way this works is uh, really strange. There's like um, kind of like an internal uh, VLAN type thing when it's uh, doing um, certain internal uh, configurations. So it's not like, I don't know if it's like an actual VLAN, but yeah, it's like something that's built into the system um, for internal use only uh, for, I guess, OS communication. I'm not even sure. Um, but we haven't actually done our OSPF yet. So uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to jump into uh, OSPF and we're going to go ahead and create, um, let's see, create area. And if we look at um, some of our options here, um, we can create an area based on uh, IP address or um, keyword, in which case we have one option, which is backbone. And that's what we're going to do because the backbone OSPF is, I think, basically what you'd find as area zero on a Cisco router. Um, it's, it's the default OSPF area and for basic networks like this, we don't care about doing multi-area really, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and do that. And it's not actually uh, obviously taking um, effect yet uh, because of the scratch pad, so we're gonna go ahead and do a couple of these other commands as well at the same time. Uh, OSPF, add interface, and then this is where we have to remember the name of our interface. Um, although I think it says we can actually do it by name or IP address, but we're going to do it by name because we still remember the name of the interface is OSPF link. And then you can do different types of OSPF interfaces, um, but we're looking for the one that says to area. And then same thing, we're going to do, um, we're going to add that interface to the OSPF backbone. Um, and this is the one thing, uh, the next command here, which tripped me up because I had to read the manual to figure this one out. Uh, on a Cisco router, when you enter the OSPF configuration with the command, let's say, uh, router OSPF1, which basically takes you into the OSPF process, by doing that, you're running OSPF. Uh, on the Riverstone, even though we've added these commands, OSPF won't run until you type in this one magic command, and that is... OSPF start and that's uh, the same thing with BGP uh, if you do a bunch of BGP configuration uh, it won't actually be running the process in the operating system until you use the word start and I think it also applies to like any of that layer 3 uh, routing protocols but um, so anyway all of this is still in scratchpad if we do the show scratchpad we do see that we have three OSPF commands ready to execute. Uh, let's go for it. Um, save active. And, okay, routing configurations are done. Um, okay. Um, I think we are okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to... Oh. Hey, look. So OSPF came up, and we're starting to see console messages because we are still using the actual uh, serial console. Um, immediately, it detected that we have um, a change in our OSPF routing table, blah, blah, blah. And let's just verify this. Uh, we're going to get out of configure mode, and we're going to do um, OSPF show. Uh, I think we're going to do show interfaces first. And that basically confirms that we do have an active interface on this system in, uh, in the OSPF configuration, and it's running. Uh, and next thing we're going to do is we're going to do show... Nope. OSPF show uh, neighbor. And there we go. So the Cisco router that I've got configured, its neighbor ID is this IP here, and then its interface address is this. And as you remember from the interface we just configured in the Riverstone, um, the Riverstone's IP was 10.20.30.2, and the Cisco router is 10.20.30.1, 
And yeah, it's basically we've got our uh, OSPF neighbor established. And I think what we're going to do now is um, uh, let's show the routing table. So to do that, you go into IP, show, and then if we look at some of the different options here, um, you could do look up interfaces, look up uh, miscellaneous crap, but uh, the one we're looking for is routes. Uh, so what we're looking at here, um, you can see that we have uh, our management IP, which is a directly connected route, and it's on the EN0 interface. Uh, we have our OSPF communication link, which is a uh, directly connected network, and the listed interface is the name we gave it, OSPF link. Um, then what it comes up with is uh, these two routes here. These are like dummy routes that I created on the Cisco router to basically populate the routing table with something. So uh, if we look at these two destinations, 10.44.45.1 and 100.127.0.1, um, the Riverstone sees these networks and the gateway for that is the Cisco router and owner, I guess, is basically the process or whatever that is uh, distributing those routes, and it comes up as OSPF. And you'll notice this is actually slightly different. Um, this one just says OSPF, this one says OSPF IA. And I think what happened here is this particular route, um, I, I actually have in a separate area on the Cisco router, not actually in the backbone. So it's basically... Um, uh, I don't really remember a whole lot of my OSPF, but uh, if it's in, like, um, there's, like, stubby areas or not-so-stubby areas or uh, strange terminology like that where um, if it's not just everything in the default area, then it's these different zones or whatever the hell. And um, I don't know. It's, it's not something I really need to know for my job, so I haven't memorized that stuff, but... Yeah, that's basically how we have our uh, routes in OSPF. And if you're going into other crazy things like distributing your um, directly connected networks into OSPF, then you have to go and do a bunch of other stuff. But um, yeah, I don't think we're going to jump into that because, you know, what's the point? Um, this Riverstone, while it's neat... Uh, I really don't think I'm going to keep it. As soon as we're uh, wrapping up this video, I'm probably going to take it back to the garbage because uh, it's it's basically a, it's a dead platform. There's nothing you can really do with them other than labs. Uh, no one with any intelligence would ever really want to put a Riverstone into production in 2020. It's kind of ridiculous, but yeah. Um, my experience with these over the years, though, uh, I didn't, I didn't mind them, but the, uh, the one Riverstone that we had, uh, where I worked, um, it was, uh, its uptime was so long that parts of it were physically breaking. Uh, I think the, um, let's see what happened. I think its flash media would corrupt itself or it was losing its configuration, so... Um, if it ever reloaded, the thing would probably not come back up. And, uh, we had that thing running for years in that state. And then eventually we de we decommissioned the whole site and were able to throw that thing out. So, uh, but yeah, that was like a, a giant Riverstone 38,000. And I mean, it did its job. Uh, we had everything connected to it and, uh, it basically worked as a giant switch and it did that for years and years and... Yeah, it's not too bad. Um, there's other things with Riverstone. Um, there's uh, the documentation says something about uh, the routing table limit, and I don't know if this is able to be changed based on how much memory you have in the system. But the documentation for the RS um, the RS eight thousand, and I think some of the other ones, uh, it says the routing table limit is like two hundred and fifty thousand routes. And back in the early 2000s, that might have been acceptable because the BGP global routing table was less than 250,000 routes. 
Uh, that sure won't fly, though, in these days, because uh, I think our routing table is upwards of like 600 or 700,000 700, routes, I think. Um, I forget the last time I checked, but yeah. So if you can't increase the routing table capacity of the Riverstone, uh, you you wouldn't even be able to do any BGP peering because it, it wouldn't be able to hold the global routing table. So, yeah, I don't know. Other than that, though, I mean, for MPLS, uh, that's something I wouldn't mind taking a look at one day, but uh, I don't think it's physically worth storing the Riverstone RS8000 anywhere in my house, um, just because the thing is so large, and I'm not going to ever keep it running for long, because it's, in it's incredibly loud. Um, this microphone might even be picking it up in the background. I've actually got it in another room, and I still hear it as being the loudest thing in my house. So uh, it's, a, it's a neat device, and um, I kind of enjoyed being able to use a Riverstone again, um, but honestly, yeah, I much prefer Cisco equipment or most any other equipment other than Riverstone. But yeah, anyway, uh, I think that covers everything I want to talk about. Um, it was kind of interesting trying to find this information online because there's really nothing about Riverstones left on the internet. Um, yeah, but uh, I might uh, revisit this subject in the future. Um, I suspect we're not ever going to throw out the pile of Riverstones where I got this one from, so uh, maybe I'll grab one of these smaller Riverstones and uh, play around with that. Um, it did have some interesting features like the RS3000, uh, we were actually using them for application load balancers because that feature was actually built into them. Um, but yeah, we might look at that someday, but uh, other than that, who knows? Uh, anyway, I think we're going to wrap this up now. Um, I hope you enjoy learning about Riverstone Networks. Um, yeah, thanks for watching.